and thank you all for coming. Uh, so I said, we've been doing these, these open tech talks for over a year now, and it's wonderful to get the local community in as well as locals, and in some cases, uh, non-locals like Panosh, uh, to share with, with all of us the work that they've been doing. Uh, so I, first, uh, I'd like to give uh, a plug for the Tech Talk series and also, as far as I know, for the first time in public, uh, to announce uh, a microsite, data.linkedin.com. So if you're interested in learning in general what we're doing at LinkedIn, I encourage you uh, to look there at the projects, people, uh, and also uh, publications uh, that are coming out of, uh, of LinkedIn. So data.linkedin.com. Uh, but now it's my pleasure to, to introduce Panush. Um, I actually uh, met Panush when I was living in New York. And uh, he's, of course, been a professor at NYU. Uh, before that, was did his PhD at Columbia uh, with Luis uh, Gravano. Uh, and Panush is really some, someone extraordinary in that uh, he has a you know, background, obviously, in computer science. Uh, but decided to go to the dark side, if you will, or behind enemy lines, as he put on his blog, to work in the business school there. And I think it's just very unusual to find somebody who combines uh, the expertise that he's developed uh, in both computer science and business. As an example of, of what he's done to illustrate that, you know, there's a popular uh, field of sentiment analysis, trying to figure out what words mean, if they're positive or negative. Uh, but leave it to Panish to actually take that to the next level by seeing if you can correlate these kinds of words and phrases to money and doing econometric analysis on the words or phrases that would appear in reviews in this project called Economining, which I believe he did in combination with a Microsoft research grant. Uh, it's phenomenal. And in fact, I even tried to get him to start a, a company on it, but uh, he... Uh, could not be pulled out of the ivory tower, except apparently by, uh, by Odesk, where he's now also uh, working uh, and, as, uh, in a consultative or scientific capacity. Uh, but of course, the reason you're here, and I think what Panish is most known for, uh, is his work on crowdsourcing, on analyzing uh, what Turkers do, what motivates them, who they are, and of course, uh, what makes crowdsourcing effective. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, Introduce you again to Panos to talk about crowdsourcing and achieving data quality with imperfect humans. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel, for uh, the introduction. So what I'm going to talk today is uh, I will give an overview of uh, work that I have been doing over the last uh, approximately five years and uh, how we used Mechanical Turk in order to improve uh, machine learning uh, models. And uh, uh, I will give a set of uh, applications uh, that uh, will motivate that. So let me start uh, by describing a concrete application uh, which motivated a lot of uh, the work, but uh, you can see how it generalizes. So uh, this chart uh, shows the following. Shows uh, what percentage of the marketing budget in the US gets allocated to different mediums uh, compared to what percent of time people spend in different uh, media. So for example, you can see that uh, for TV, people spend 37% uh, of their time uh, watching uh, TV, and 32% uh, of the marketing spending goes there. Uh, the outlier is the internet, where people spend a lot of uh, their time there. But correspondingly, uh, the marketing budget that gets allocated there is not uh, correspondingly high. Uh, the question is why this thing uh, happens. Uh, to understand that, we need to understand uh, how marketing works. So most of the marketing that uh, tech people are used to is uh, the model of Google, uh, where you have ads, people click on them, and uh, you get paid by the click. Uh, traditionally, in marketing, uh, this uh, pay per action model corresponds uh, to what is in marketing uh, the basement. Uh, these are the guys that have been traditionally doing direct marketing and, uh, you know, telemarketers and so on. The prestigious jobs in marketing are not this type of jobs. Uh, it's uh, brand advertising where you don't necessarily look for an immediate action from user, but instead you want to create a brand. For example, when you are watching ads about uh, Delta in diff many different sites, they don't care if you click and book your flight then, but next time, that you're going to go for a flight, you want to uh, think of Delta and uh, go there. So 
Brand advertisers are, are freaked out by the internet because they are very much worried about where their ads are going to end up. When they place an ad in the newspaper, they go and say, I want uh, a big ad in New York Times, in Sunday New York Times, uh, in that section. On the internet, they have very little control of where the ad is going to be uh, placed, especially by uh, networks. Now, uh, this was kind of preventing uh, adoption. And uh, here's an example of such an inappropriate placement. This is an article in New York Times describing uh, the shootings of uh, Congresswoman uh, Gabriel Gibbons, where he describes how uh, the guy took the gun and started shooting and so on. And uh, here is the ad that is being delivered uh, next to this article. The relevance algorithm did a tremendously good job here. It describes shootings and uh, whether the person hit the target and so on. So this is an extremely relevant ad to the content and uh, extremely inappropriate as well. And uh, other brands have uh, similar problems with inappropriate placements where the ad might appear in places where it shouldn't uh, be. So uh, almost four or five years back, uh, I have these uh, guys from MadSafe Media that they come to me. They say they want to create a startup that will detect uh, pages with inappropriate, different types of inappropriate content. So I look at that, see, oh, mm, very interesting. So it's 95. Again, people want to build web page classifiers. Uh, then I realized uh, after studying the problem that uh, it is not as simple as it seems. So the key demand there is you want to build different types of classifiers for web pages very, very quickly. So for example, there is a pharmaceutical firm that comes and says, uh, we have the following problem. Uh, there is a swine flu epidemic. And our drug is being used off-label by doctors in order to treat swine flu. Off-label means that it has not been approved by the FDA to be used for this reason. Uh, the pharmaceutical firm didn't explicitly advertise. Of course, they couldn't do that, but they didn't object. And they were placing ads of their product uh, in various websites. The FDA comes and says, hey, 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 what's going on here? You are not supposed to use this drug to treat swine flu, and you know that very, very well. And uh, here is a fine of uh, a few billion dollars that awaits you if you continue this practice. So the pharmaceutical firm has the following option. Shut down the overall marketing campaign that they are running for everything, or try to find a way not to appear in websites that uh, discuss swine flu. So they come to us and they say, we have three days to, to build a classifier that will detect whether swine flu is being uh, discussed in this uh, Page. Similarly, a big fast food company comes and says, uh, we don't want to appear in any web pages that discuss our brand. 99% of the time, they don't get good press coverage. And uh, they would, we don't want to appear in any web pages that discuss uh, diabetes, uh, sorry, obesity, diabetes, and cholesterol, and all the other things that are related with uh, fast food. An airline company doesn't want to appear in anything that discusses accidents, uh, terrorist activities against airlines, and uh, so on. Uh, and these things need to be built extremely fast. You have a few days. Now, traditionally, if we want to build a classifier, we would have start by collecting slowly training data and uh, annotate everything, uh, you know, what is this page containing, uh, you know, material about uh, terrorist attacks and so on. Collect the data, extract features, and uh, then build the classifier. However, we don't have time for that. We, however, what we can do is we can uh, use uh, outsourcing to send things, for example, to Mechanical Turk or Desk and so on, where people are going to look at a page and detect whether there is any type of uh, content. You know, for example, do you see any obesity-related material? Yes or no. Do you see any diabetes-related material? Yes or no. Uh, the problem with that is that uh, when you send things uh, to such sites, you are not quite sure about the quality of the people that are doing this uh, tagging. On the other hand, the cost is so low and the ability to scale is so high that is uh, an attractive alternative. So uh, I guess most of you know what uh, Mechanical Perk is, is but uh, here is an example. Uh, Chris Carlson Birds uh, that wants to identify Arabic dialect in text. Uh, he posts approximately 14,000 uh, documents online and uh, pays five cents for people that know Arabic to identify 
what is the dialect for this text. And uh, here's how it looks like uh, the task. So he has uh, uh, the text uh, here and says, uh, is the dialect, uh, you know, from the Liban uh, region? It, is it uh, from Iraq, uh, Egypt, or Moroccan, and so on? And uh, people that know Arabic can do that very, very easily. And uh, he gets back the results. Now, back to our own application. The first application that we wanted to build uh, was uh, build a classifier that detects whether there is any adult content in a page. So you look at a page and uh, you can classify it either as general audience, nothing objectionable, and so on. PG-13, uh, content that might not be appropriate for small kids, like uh, you know, uh, in the GQ uh, magazine or discussing uh, you know, who is dating whom in gossip sites and so on. Uh, restricted, it means that uh, you have to be 17 and above uh, to see this content and uh, hardcore porn. So we started with a few undergraduate interns. Uh, after getting hold of the task, uh, they were doing approximately one website every 20 seconds. So for a cost of approximately $15 per hour. Uh, then we also tried Mechanical Turk. And uh, we see that we can go up to 2,500 websites uh, for a total cost actually for that was slightly lower. So great results, 10 times higher productivity, even at the same cost or even lower. Looked good, people were happy until we started taking a look at the results. So we look at the website. So this guy with the ID ATAMR044 and so on, he looks at the website allvintageporn.net, classification, general audience. Hot XXX Asia, general audience. And this thing continues. So the guy was just sitting there and was pressing general audience, general audience, general audience. Tick, click, 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 click. He was not even looking, not even at the URLs of the websites that he was uh, classifying. Everything was general audience. Uh, so. How can we solve this problem? Well, one idea is uh, you can use redundancy. Instead of asking one pe person to look at uh, uh, the website, you might ask multiple ones. So in that case, we have, for example, 10 different workers, and uh, they look at the website 25u.com. Everyone agrees, G, 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 general audience. For 30 plus 40 plus.com, hmm, all the other guys are saying this is a hardcore porn. But our guy here, our spammer, sticks out and says, this is general audience. Initially, we thought that it would be a cool research problem to solve. So you have a lot of things for which you don't know the correct answer, and you want to find the correct answer. So you have web pages that you don't know if they contain porn or not. You have a bunch of people that you don't know how good they are, and you are trying at the same time to figure out both how good they are and what is the correct answer that you should expect? Uh, until we realized that uh, the problem has been solved 30 years back in the field of medical statistics, the problem that they had there was that they had patients that they had some disease, but they didn't know exactly what. And they had doctors that were doing the residency, and they were being effectively tested to see how well they can diagnose different types of uh, diseases. And uh, this uh, work by Dewitt and Skinny, using the then novel algorithm of expectation maximization, works as follows. Uh, it starts by saying, OK, let's take the majority vote to be the correct answer, right? We don't know what it is, but we estimate to be the majority vote. Then you estimate, you compare the answers of each person with the majority vote. How well does this person agree? And uh, the error rate looks like that, you know, how often the person says G when the majority, for example, is G. So, or how often does the person says X when the majority says G, and so on. The next step is you say, okay, now we know approximately the error rate of each worker. We don't want to trust similarly the person that has high quality with the person that has low quality. So you re-estimate the majority vote, I'm using quotes for the majority, but adjust it with a weight that corresponds to the quality of this person. 
So the better the person, the higher the weight of the vote that they are cast. And you repeat this process again and again. This converges pretty quickly, actually. And what you get back is an estimate of how this person gives answers. So for example, our spammer, every time, 99% of the time, when he was looking at a web page that was good, he was classifying it as good. That's nice. However, whenever he was looking uh, at a web page that is porn, 99% of the time also classified this as porn. So effectively, we can see from here that uh, while he's very good in classifying things as uh, good pages as good, he's also classifying everything else as good. So he just sits and press good, 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 good. And he hopes that you're not going to check the results and you're going to pay. Uh, and in the last few years, many variations of the same algorithm have reappeared, uh, trying to control for all sorts of things like difficulty of an example, expertise of the workers, and so on. But the common thing that everyone returns is this confusion matrix. We look at that and say, okay, problem solved. We have the confusion matrix of the worker, so we can estimate how good the worker is. So the higher the number of incorrect decisions, everything that is not in the diagonal, the worse the worker, right? All these decisions correspond to correct decisions. All these things outside of the diagonal are incorrect decisions. Uh, well, unfortunately, that was not the case. We're not done. First of all, uh, the spammers are not really stupid. They actually, they are trying to get your money so they are trying to do things that are not tremendously stupid. So in our case, for example, most of the material, thankfully, was not porn. So something like we're taking approximately 15% of uh, porn pages that we're sending to the workers. The spammer looked at that and said, you know what? If I say always that everything is okay, there is only the occasional porn page in the pages that I classify that's going to be incorrect. So even if, he, you know, even if I always say general audience, my error rate is going to be pretty low. And indeed, this spammer that is classifying everything as G, since most of the guy, uh, sites are G, just by saying everything is G, his error rate is just 15%. A good worker, not actually, not perfect, but decent worker that has a 20% error rate, but in both directions, has the problem that he generates an error rate of 20%. So in that case, the spammer seems to have a lower error rate than a legitimate worker. Well, there are techniques to deal with that, with this imbalanced uh, data set, so we're thinking what we can do until we run into a more difficult problem. We say, okay, now we, have, uh, we can estimate the error rate of uh, people, now let's uh, rank and kick out of our workforce all the bad spammers. So we rank, and at the very top of the worst offenders, the CEO of the company, followed by all the internal employees that were labeling web pages. So I look at that, okay, I have a bug. There is no way that all the internal employees are so, so bad. And uh, I check, no bug, and then I realize here's what happens. Here is the confusion matrix for the CEO of AdSafe. Here's what she was doing. Uh, she has a family with young kids. And also she has a company that tries to detect objectionable content on the internet. Try to think of what bias she has. Whenever she was looking at uh, pages with general audience content, very, very rarely she was classifying this thing as general audience. 80% of the time she was classifying, oh, this is parental guidance. I would never let my kids look at this content. It is objectionable, you know, they need parental supervision. Whenever she was looking at content that was PG-13, she was always classifying it as R-17. You have to be 17 and above to look at this content. Whenever she was looking at content that was R-rated, she was classifying it fine, and same thing for porn. Now. Due to this bias that she had here, her error rate, 
since he was nev almost never classifying things correctly in the general audience, was 73%. While the spammer that was doing things completely randomly, he had an error rate of 15%. Here is, however, what happens. So the error rates of the CEO and the error rate of the spammer might have a big difference. However, for the errors of uh, the CEO, we have the ability to correct them very easily. So whenever C says G, well, we know it is G. Whenever it says PG-13, well, it is never PG-13. We know that. It's always G. So despite the fact that C is wrong, C is so predictably wrong that we can correct it very easily. So without even telling her. Whenever C says R, we have a little bit of confusion whether it's going to be PG-13 or R, but that's the real error. And whenever it says porn, everything is fine. If you compare now with the spammer, whenever the spammer says G, we have no clue about what is the correct page. It might be anything. We have no information uh, from uh, the spammer. So he says G, but it can be anything. So in order to estimate the, qu the quality, the true quality of uh, the workers, what we do now is first we reverse the bias of the workers. And we say, OK, when this person says, for example, the spammer says G, what is the best that we can think about this page? Well, we say it can be 25% G, 25% can be PG-13, and so on. So if we try to classify this page, the expected misclassification cost that we're going to have is 0 0.75. Effectively, there is one choice that is correct, and everything else is wrong. For the CEO, whenever she says PG-13, we have no ambiguity about what is the correct class. We know that it is G. So despite the fact that she's saying PG-13 and she's giving an incorrect answer, the expected misclassification cost that we have for that is actually zero. So she should not be penalized for that. And based on this metric, we create this, what we call a quality score for each worker, which says the quality score is one minus uh, the ratio of uh, the expected misclassification cost of the worker divided by the cost of the spammer. The good thing with this metric is that it's a single metric. It's not a matrix and so on. So a single score from 1 to 0, sometimes even below 0, but I will skip that part. And uh, you can rank the workers very nicely and uh, reward or kick out uh, the bad workers. One thing that we noticed is we started by saying, OK, whoever has quality less than 50%, for example, we kick them out. Unfortunately, this gives a wrong incentive to people. They are either, they either pass the threshold or they are below the threshold and they kicked out. And uh, this doesn't give the correct incentives to people to give you the best of their work. They just want to be above the threshold. So for that, instead, what we have is this idea that uh, what we call quality-sensitive payment. We say, OK, what is the quality that we expect to get? 99%. OK, so for that, we pay, let's say, a dollar per page. If someone doesn't meet this quality threshold, we don't kick them out. It doesn't make sense to kick them out, because they might give us something that is still useful. And we say, OK. Let's suppose that we have a worker that is 90% accurate in his decisions. How many of these workers do we need to combine together in order to get an expected quality of 99%? Well, in that case, for example, it is five workers. If you have five workers, workers that are 99% accurate, the majority vote of these guys gives you 99% expected accuracy. So these guys that have 90% accuracy get paid one-fifth of uh, the salary of the top workers. Same thing uh, for guys that have, let's say, 80% accuracy and uh, so on. This gives now a declining rate of payment, which gives the incentives to people to start being more accurate. Because the moment that they start being more accurate, their salary actually increases quite drastically until they reach the desired level of uh, uh, quality. And uh, we have some other you know, tricks I will not cover them uh, here where we uh, try to 
incorporate the uncertainty that we have about its guy. And if we penalize a worker early, so you started, we did some mistakes in our estimate, we detected that you are not so good, so we underpaid you. Uh, if we detect that, that, that over time people get better, we refund them the, uh, the payment that uh, didn't get earlier. Uh, now, any questions so far? Or? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, the question is whether we took into consideration uh, the severity of the error. So for example, if you classify a G page as porn, it has the result of blocking the page. The opposite mistake might have a much severe, more severe penalty where you expose the porn page into a general audience site. And uh, also the mistake of classifying a PG-13 as R and vice versa should be correspondingly uh, smaller. Yes, we have it and it's fully incorporated in the model. You pass a cost matrix and uh, the quality actually accommodates that. So remind me to give the point for the software at the end, which is open source and available. Uh, so, so far I described just the process of uh, collecting data. Of course, we don't want to hunt, classify the whole internet. When you are dealing with two billion classifications a day, well, we simply cannot do that you know, with crowdsourcing. Uh, instead, we use this thing to build a classifier. So when you're building a classifier, there is this interesting thing that happens. Here is a toy example where we are trying to build a classifier that uh, detects whether a mushroom is poisonous or not. And here is the performance of uh, the classifier in the y-axis, and the x-axis is the number of examples in the training set. If our data in the training set is perfect, this is how fast we learn. After 200 examples, we have a perfect classifier. We started adding noise to the data and starting randomly flipping uh, the labels. You can see, for example, if the quality is 80%, we still learn, but we learn more slowly. If we have a quality of 60%, we learn, but much more slowly. And if we have 50%, effectively, everything is random. Here, a garbage in, garbage out, we don't learn anything. Here's now an interesting trade-off when you have a budget, when you're trying to build your model. So the CEO comes and says, you have $10,000 to label pages and build a classifier. How can we best allocate this budget? As we build the classifier, we always now have the following trade-off. Get more data. The bigger the training set, the better the quality of the classifier, the better the accuracy. Or look again at the data that we gathered and trying to improve the quality. So we always have this trade-off. More data, oops. More data or better data. So I will not bother you too much uh, with uh, the details, but effectively what we are trying to do is we're trying to say, okay, this is how fast we improve quality of the classifier, accuracy, if we improve the quality of the data. Here is the gradient if we follow this curve, if we get more data. And here is the gradient if we get better data. And at every point of the, cla of the classifier, we try to estimate what is this gradient. How quickly does the classifier improve as we get more data? We do cross-validation with increasingly larger training data, and we see how quickly the accuracy increases. The other choice is we start adding noise to the data and see how quickly the quality deteriorates in the classifier. And we compare what gradient is the best. And at every point, we can say, get more data or get better data. Uh, rule of thumb results, if we have high quality workers, 85% and above accuracy, uh, more data is better. This is effectively the big data approach today, right? So we have data on the web that are noisy and so on, but if you have a lot of them, the classifiers can deal with that, can learn with such level of noise. If you have a lot of noise, and this is actually something that happens often in Mechanical Turk, it's always better to go and get better quality data. 
until you hit the point where you, know, you start getting uh, more data. You can do even better things if you start targeting specific uh, examples that are more difficult, they have more ambiguity and so on. Uh, you can actually get tremendous efficiencies uh, uh, in budget. We managed with this selective uh, targeting, we managed to decrease the cost by 70%, but I will skip this thing. There is a paper on the web called Repeated Labeling. If people are interested in the technicalities, they can read it. Now, at this point, I kind of treated humans as passive recipients of data that they need to label. While this is a good idea sometimes, it's often wasteful when you are trying to classify things that are sparse on the web. So for example, uh, there is a request, come and uh, build a classifier that detects hate speech on the web. If you try randomly to sample pages on the web and try to find pages that contain racism or uh, anti-Semitism and so on, you're not going to find that many pages by randomly sampling. Which means that you are going to give pages to people to label. You give them a thousand pages, they are going to find five of them that contain hate speech. This is not good. Just wasted effort in saying there is no hate speech, there is no hate speech, there is no hate speech, and so on. So instead, we built a system where we say, you know what, I want to build a classifier that uh, will detect hate speech, or that will detect gambling, or will detect illegal drug use, and so on. And then we say, go out on the web and find such pages. And uh, this is uh, what we call guided learning, where, where you have these niche types of content on the internet, it uh, actually works very well. So let me see if I can. Ah, good. So here's, for example, we say build something that will detect hate speech. Uh, people go on the web, they submit back URLs. And what I really like about crowdsourcing is not the cheap cost. Here, actually, you will see good examples. People have extreme diversity of thinking of what exactly is hate speech. If I give to any single one of you and say, find me pages that contain hate speech, most people have a limited view of what exactly to search for. So I started doing it myself. I was thinking, okay, let's try to find some racism websites, anti-Semitism, and I stopped there. Here we have guys that find, for example, male chauvinist, you know, a guy that hates women. You know, I mean, he goes on in his blog and talks and talks and talks about that. So there are other guys that, uh, you know, hate uh, data miners. I kid you not. So, and uh, there is a wide diversity of uh, content. Of course, you get also things like white power form and uh, the vanilla uh, Ku Klux Klan type of uh, material. So, dun, dun, dun. let me close that. Mm. How do I resume this? Okay, good. So, and this actually can build uh, very nicely a classifier. You just describe the content. L literally, we have a system that you go and say, I want a classifier that will detect this type of content. People find the content on the web, comes back, being, being, it's being vetted. You train a classifier. And typically, within 24 hours, you have a classifier that detects your niche content on the web. Very cheaply, very easily. And uh, hopefully, we'll try to make this thing open source within the next few weeks. Here is now the problem that you run after you have a system. After a while, people, while you have initial diversity, after a while, this diversity stops. People submit yet another racist jokes web page, yet another Ku Klux Klan page, yes, yet another you know white honor web page, and so on. And uh, this content the classifier can detect already, so it doesn't help us to improve the classification. So, and here's what happens in that case. This is the big problem. Since you are building the classifier using training data you start getting into a mode of blissful ignorance. So for example, we had the hate speech 
classifier. We do the usual things that uh, people do with machine learning. Uh, we cross-validate the sample and we see that our H-pitch classifier is great, 99 point something accuracy. And of course, this is the performance that you are selling to your uh, clients. You know, our web H-pitch classifier is 99.99% accurate. However, the world is not completing within your training data. We have an open world. And we have the problem of what we call, with a reference to Donald Trumpsfeld, the unknown unknowns. Cases where you fail, but you don't even know that you are failing. Here's an example. We have the guy that has a blog. He says, I hate retards and autistic children. So our classifier looks at that. There was nothing like that in our training data. The classifier looks at that and doesn't find any terms that would indicate that this is hate speech. And with 100% confidence says, there is no hate speech here. So you can place ads that are relevant to the content. And we get the ad, the child day preschools being placed against this content. And uh, this is a big fail waiting to happen where, you know, and then you have all this uh, reputational damage to the company where, you know, look, look, look what type of content they managed to uh, misclassify. At this point, uh, explanations about ROC curves and uh, precision and trickle and so on, they are completely moot. I mean, you failed badly. So we're trying to figure out how can we be a little bit more proactive with that? How can we improve our systems without waiting for them to to fail in the wild. So for that, we built the system that we call Beat the Machine. It's a kind of gamified, I don't like the term, but uh, here's what it does. It says, here's a black box that we have. It takes as input a URL and gives us output the classification. So your task is to do the following. You want to find the URL where the classifier is going to classify it incorrectly while a human that is going to check it afterwards will say that it belongs to the offensive class. So for example, go out and find pages that contain hate speech where the classifier is going to be saying that there is no hate speech. And uh, we deployed the system and people started playing with that. And remember, right, the only thing that they see is a black box. Submit a URL and you get back a label. And uh, people started playing with our classifiers, and actually they were really, really good at finding holes in our system. It is very similar, actually, to this idea of uh, penetration testing in security, where you get, get a hacker says, here's my network, trying to penetrate it. Similar thing, but the, you know, for machine learning systems. Try to get the machine to fail. Uh, for hate speech, for example, they submitted a thousand URLs as probes. 16% of them, they were successful in getting the classifier to fail. Uh, for illegal drug use, 500 URLs submitted, 26 of them correctly causing the classifier to fail, 5% uh, error rate, and so on. Uh, the basic idea is that these error rates were 10 to 100% higher than the error rates that we were measuring in the training data. So people were really good at trying different combinations and guessing what is going to cause the classifier to fail. Uh, then we said, okay, do they really find systematic errors or these are just random outliers here and there? Uh, we checked actually the following that uh, while if you just throw these errors in the training data, you don't improve your classifier, it's a hard problem because you feed too many ambiguous and strange cases in the training data, we can learn the errors. We can learn that this probe is going to be successful. So, which means that there is a pattern in uh, the errors that people submit. And then as we deploy the system, we realize that uh, people actually they are doing the following. Once they find a hole in the system, we're saying if you submit an unsuccessful probe, you get paid one cent. If you submit something successful, you get paid one dollar. So the incentives is for people to go and find actually content that will break the classifier. The problem is that once they find the hole, they keep probing. So for example, they figured out that our porn classifier was not good at multilingual content. All our 
training data was in English. So effectively, we started getting uh, things like Japanese porn, Chinese porn, you know, uh, German porn, Finnish porn, and so on. People figured out, you know, multilingual, you fail. We got so many multilingual things. But after a while, OK, we got it. We get it. We get it. You know, we suck at multilingual. We don't need more such examples. Our classifier still fails, but now this is not unknown unknown. This is a known unknown. We know that we suck at multilingual. So we'll fix it, but we don't need it any more examples. So what we are doing now is, remember, we can learn whether something is going to be successful. If we detect first, we give the highest reward to people that submit content that cause the classifier to fail, and we don't know about that. If we detect that this content is a known probe, it's a known vulnerability, then get the people still get paid, but less. You know, this is a known unknown. And we give the lowest uh, amount of reward when things where the classifier already says, you know what, I don't know about this one. It seems a little bit ambiguous. So the classifier already knows that uh, is uncertain. So even if the classification is incorrect, uh, we pay still people for finding an incorrect decision for the classifier. But if the classifier already knows that this is going to be incorrect, uh, we stop. So any questions? And actually, this is a nice idea. It can be used for a wide variety of uh, automatic uh, systems. Just expo expose your system to people and try to get them to do early detection of uh, failures. Yes? Ah, yeah, that's the problem is that if you are talking about web pages, right, this makes sense when you are talking about it. Ah, the classifier, yeah. The question is if we know that the classifier uh, is certain in certain area? Uncertain. Yeah, that's the case of active learning. Active learning is doing that, it's trying to find things that are uncertain, and you ask people to classify these things again. The unknown unknowns that we have are things where the classifier is very certain, but wrong. So it says, I don't detect any hate speech here, despite the fact that there is hate speech. And these are the cases where we reward people for finding. Cases where the classifier already says, I'm uncertain about this one. Uh, we say, OK, thanks for identifying this problem. But we already knew that we're, the classifier already knew that uh, this is a very uncertain page. So they get much lower reward. And you can still use these examples for uh, training the classifier. Actually, this is the classic case of active learning. This is case of trying to detect cases where you fail with confidence. Now, uh, OK, so I have some time. So, so far, I have described cases where I'm trying to measure the performance of people and try to give them rewards for behaving in a certain way. The problem is that people don't like to be rated at all. For example, where people were classifying uh, web pages and so on, uh, a guy saw his score dropping from 100% to something like 95%, while he believed that he's giving correct answers. He started writing a long, long, long email, you know, beep, 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 I know what you are trying to do. You are trying to fire me. You are trying, trying to reject my work. I know your kind, your requesters on Mechanical Turk. You are trying to scam us. And uh, I know all these automatic evaluations. You know that I'm sending good work. And I'm saying, like, I look at that. He, the guy was really, really good. And he was one of the top workers say, wow, that's unexpected. Uh, the other extreme is the guy that uh, uh, saw his score also dropping and says, hey, boss, 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 please don't fire me, please don't fire me, please don't fire me, please don't fire me. You know, I really like this job. Tell me how we can improve. And look at that, you know, I want to say, yeah, you're great. I mean, 92% is really, really good, so don't worry. And uh, I had this problem actually it was making crowdsourcing less efficient if you have to interact with too many workers to keep them happy so that they don't go to forums to bad mouth you and so on it was taking effort now two years back I'm in a conference which is kind of strange National Academy of Science Frontiers of Science what they do is they take people from widely different disciplines 
physicists, economists, neurobiologists, uh, computer scientists, and they put us in an auditorium and they say, talk. No agenda. Just talk about your work. We are trying to encourage connections. So I'm presenting uh, this work on spam detection. So I have uh, Don Cooper, who is a, a neurobiologist in uh, University of Colorado. Uh, yes. Your workers behave like my mice. And my reaction is, do tell. So here's what it tells. What you see here is the case where workers, they are trying to use their motor skills and not their cognitive skills. What does this mean? It means that they go, they like to go click, 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 and not think about it. See? Uh, and here's the biology fundamental. So your brain, well, this fact that it's something like three pounds of material, uh, it consumes 20% of your energy. It's a very energy-hungry organ in your body. So biologically, your body is trying to reduce the amount of energy that is being spent thinking. And it delegates tasks that are well known to other parts of the body. So for example, when you're walking, you don't think about it. It's uh, delegated to the autonomous nervous uh, system. So when you're bicycling, uh, the same. And uh, this saves energy from uh, the brain. And uh, says, uh, Don says, what you observe is the tendency of people to delegate a task from their brain to their muscles. We go click, 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 and get done with that. That's the most energy efficient thing to do. I say, hmm, makes sense. Uh, thank you for the observation. Very nice connection. I will use it in my talks. And uh, I say, hey, 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 I'm not, I'm not done. Do tell. Here's how I'm training my mice to use their brain. Here's the idea. <coughs> oh, sorry. He's training mice, and he's, he has two tasks. One is where uh, mice are using their motor skills. They, they have things with pellets here. The mice go, they press a lever, and they get food. This is the motor skill. You press, you eat. You press, you eat. That's the reward. The cognitive task is there is food in the maze, and the mice needs to go into the maze, solve the maze, and get to the food. Of course, if you leave it like that, people just go to these things, and uh, they get their pellets. They press the lever, they get the pellets. Uh, because what they are doing to train the mice, you don't get food to them all the time here. You make it probabilistic. So mice go there, click. Click, click, where's my food? Click, yeah, you know, might as well go and solve the, the maze. I know how to do that. So it's okay, that's a nice idea. How can we apply that to humans? So, instead of showing scores to the people, I went back to my room and I say, you know what? I know the score. Instead of telling them what is the score, I'm going to penalize people that are giving bad answers. So for example, as they are rating you know, websites, they look image, uh, the bad workers, they start getting loading image. Please wait, please wait, please wait, please wait. Image didn't load, please press reload. Or, you know, 404 error, you know, return the hit and come back again. And so on, you know, you are messing with, with me, I'm messing with you. And uh, the key thing actually is to make this thing probabilistic. So you don't want to make it, you know, when they do something wrong, you see loading image, loading image, loading image. You need to confuse them, you know, so that they feel that if they are doing something wrong, they cannot quite correlate one to the other. And so I'm going and I try that. Actually, it works. It works very well. And uh, while I was giving the talk, they tell me, oh, you know what? I know this thing. This is called slow banning. Apparently, what I learned afterwards, that many websites that have communities or users, some very well-known successful websites on the internet, what they do is the following. There is this misery plugin for Drupal where if you have users that are behaving in a way that you don't like in the community, if you block them, they are going to go out, create another account, and come back. Instead, with misery, you can start saying, OK, when this account comes or when this IP comes, 
introduce a delay to the website, make the website suck. Oh God, what a horrible website. It doesn't let me leave my troll comments here. Or widescreen, wrong page, random page, 404, and so on. And you start introducing all these annoying things, making their life miserable. Uh, and open parenthesis, the, the other uh, sibling technique of that is what they called hell banning, where people not only get this treatment, but bad users, they can only see what other bad users are doing, and other people cannot see. So you have the two trolls fighting each other. You suck, no, you suck, you suck. And uh, they do it in the comments, nobody else can see them, and they feel you know, that uh, there is a lot of activity. You send them to the seventh rink of hell. So, uh, we started doing that and uh, you know, we did multiple experiments and we realized indeed spammers quickly go away. So you don't need to display scores or ban them or anything, but workers simply, their life becomes miserable and they go to the forum and say, oh, these hits suck, you know, they are so horrible, you know. The other guy replies, no, I have no problem, you know, everything seems uh, fine, you know. No, 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 they really, really bad. And uh, they go away. And uh, so instead of getting some like 100 plus submissions from uh, spammers, typically after five or so, they were uh, disappearing. And uh, we also noticed that uh, good workers were mostly unaffected, but we noticed that sometimes they're a little bit slower, even if you take all these uh, tricks that we're playing into account, uh, which was kind of strange. So actually, I'm going back to Don. I say, you know what? Your scheme works. I got rid of my spammers without even getting into controversies about bans and so on. He says, uh, did you see conversions? Conversions? Spammers start giving you good work. Yeah, doesn't work. No, 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 no. Biology is biology. You should see people converting. Nah. No, no, no. So I'm going back. And I see approximately 15 to 20% of the spammers, it was the email classification ta collection task, uh, I was asking for emails of people, so I had people submitting fred at domain.com, fred at domain.com, fred at domain.com, multiple accounts actually, trying to fool the redundancy. And after a while, I realized that these people start submitting good emails. I'm like, doesn't make sense. So I understand the spammer abandoning, but trying to spam you and then suddenly start just didn't click. Then I was reading this book, a uh, wonderful book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. He's a Nobel Prize winner for introducing uh, effectively the field of behavioral economics. So from the psychology point of view, he says that people in their brain have two systems. So the, the theory of motor skills versus cognitive didn't work. But here he says that People in their brain, they have the system one, automatic actions, and system two, the intelligent one. So for example, system one, ah, two plus two, how much? You, know, you get the answer immediately. So you know, uh, when you hear a sound, you turn there. And uh, so on, all these things are automatic for their brain, this system one. And I'm reading there, he says, find a strong move in chess. It's also system one for people that are chess masters. That seemed a little bit. People that are really good in a task, even though if this task is intelligent, they internalize this thing and they start doing it automatically. System two tasks are things like focus attention in the clones in a circus or look for a woman in an image with white hair and uh, so on. And then we realize was the following. Effectively, this system of uh, switching people back and forth, what we're trying to do is trying to get people that are using their system one, they just go automatically in things, and they don't do a good work to start thinking intelligently. On the other hand, we have people in system one, which they got so good at the task that we're giving, that they were really operating as a system one. They, 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 they were doing it automatically. They didn't need to think about that, but they were really good. When we started messing with them, we started slowing them down because we're detecting that they were good, but all these tests to see if they are good and the random interventions were actually 
kicking uh, them out. So if they are performing well, you really like these guys. They, they just go quickly and they do these uh, things well. If you see that they are not performing well, you are trying to do these nudges to kick them into the intelligent uh, uh, system. And uh, well, if they don't perform well, you kick them out. But you also try to see if the good workers are good, you are trying to get them to see tasks again and again, make it boring for them so that they use their system one and still uh, be good. Uh, I guess that's all that I have for today. So thanks. Any questions? Hey, so this is more like a practical question because you uh, touched on earlier that you wanted to make classifiers really quickly, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, when you find these uh, unknown unknowns and now they're known unknowns, how do you incorporate that data without overfitting and not having to go back and like look for it? St still working on that. Uh, we are trying to use uh, a model of uh, ensemble learning at this point. I, I don't have a definite answer. We still are not able to incorporate all these outlier errors. What we do have is this detection that we're going to fail in here, but the idea that we started playing is uh, using this model of uh, weak learning and ensemble. I can give you the details offline, but uh, yeah. we don't have a good solution oh. at this point. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, yes. Uh, it is, it's still not released. I hope that by the end of the month I will have it. It's a web service where you upload data. You submit your answers, and you can. it works even in a streaming mode. You don't need to do any batch uploads or anything. So you upload your data. You get back real-time estimates of the quality of uh, uh, the users. It can even direct you which examples in your data might need more attention and so on. Uh, still under work. It's going to be open source. Things are already on GitHub. But uh, I will announce it most, uh, most probably in a couple of weeks. Okay, But you get an early preview. Project three. I had a question about uh, how do you model deterioration of workers over time? That's one of the biggest problems I face. Workers that start off doing good work, they then figure out what is acceptable. They know they can't reach the next threshold of, of payment or incentives, and they just begin to decline over time, and they stay in this range of not being blocked and just deteriorating. Oh, over because time. I deteriorate the payment as well. I have quality sensitive yeah. payment. So the how do you do that in the Turk framework? Do you do that with bonuses or? Yes, with bonuses. Okay. But okay. I, honestly, I started so using more of a desk. What, what is the fixed price of the task then? It really depends on the task. You would okay. decide what is the price that you're going to pay for a perfect quality task. Not perfect, but 99% accuracy, for example. Okay. And uh, then you have a payment scheme that decreases. Where, did, where do you show the payment scheme? Do you show it on the hit page itself? You can when they, if you want. Okay. But, uh, Is that the best way where you show the worker what bonus structure? I haven't uh, experimented with that. So okay. different okay. people that I consult do different things. Uh, but okay. I Thanks don't a lot. have any good experiment. And hope, ah, yeah, it's not going to be in the initial version, but we're going to have the quality sensitive payment in the project TRIA as well, most probably in a month or so. More of a beginner question for someone uh -huh. who's who's new to the area. What would you recommend? Uh, which classifiers should we start out with for the machine? Part? Google Prediction API. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the simplest uh, and publicly available. Anything else? So not a question, but just an invitation to everyone to stick around. Hopefully, Panish can stay for a while. We have uh, food and drinks back here, and of course, the great company. So again, thank you, Panos, for coming. Thank you. Here.